Today, um, I'm going to be talking about some of the, the challenges um, involved in programming living cells and specifically some of the approaches that we've been using to tackling, tackling them. Um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on genetic circuits, which we, which we use to reprogram cells. So these are encoded in DNA and designed basically to control when and where genes should be turned on and off to kind of regulate the behavior of the cell in a, in a desired way. Now, the execution of these circuits involves the coordination of RNA polymerases, so these little things here, reading the DNA to produce these RNA transcripts that are then subsequently translated by ribosomes. Now, this is a really complex process, but to program it, we don't actually need to worry about a lot of those aspects, and we just need to worry about how the DNA is actually read. So to do this, um, we can make use of really simple genetic parts like promoters and terminators. So basically promoters, these things here, enable RNA polymerases, these little red dots, to bind and start reading the DNA, while these terminators cause them to halt and disassociate. And by positioning these promoters and terminators, we can actually affect where the RNA polymerase flows are able to travel, and therefore how the DNA itself is read. Now, if the DNA itself encodes for a regulatory element, like a transcription factor or repressor, like here, that affects the strength of another promoter, then we can actually connect the flow of RNA polymerase from one region of the DNA to the flow in another, and use this actually to implement genetic devices that carry out basic computational operations. So in this case, um, this is just corresponding to the implementation of what we call a not gate, or basically an inversion of the, of the signal. And the key point here that I really wanna highlight is that by using the flow of RNA polymerase as a, a common signal in these circuits, we can actually easily connect many of these genetic devices together by merely making the output promoter of one device the input promoter of another. And that's precisely what people have done over the years. And so by using this approach, we can actually develop more complex regulatory networks like this repressor circuit. Um, and really, I'd say probably over the last two decades, we've become really good at building kind of small circuits that are composed of maybe a handful of, of regulators and regulatory links. Um, and while there have been some big steps recently um, made in actually scaling the complexity of circuits, so for example, some of the automated design software like Cello, we still really struggle, I would say, to create large and robust, robust genetic systems, um, which is going to be a really a crucial step if we ever want to ultimately engineer kind of entire genomes. Now, the reason for this is that as the complexity of our circuits has grown, so too is the number of ways they can actually break. Um, and so this is just an example of some of the ways these, these things can, these can, can break down. So this can include, for example, accidentally incorporating things like cryptic promoters inside our, our, our uh, elements in our circuits, which can affect the flows that are present. Um, it could be to do just parts just failing to work. That can often happen if we're taking them from different organisms. They may not work in the host that we're interested in. Um, another kind of key effect that we often see are, are things like contextual effects, where we might have two identical parts, but when they're used in different ways, they end up performing in a very different manner. And that makes prediction of what these circuits do very difficult. And kind of one of the, the, the biggest factors at the moment that we find as these, these circuits scale is that there are often these unintended kind of interactions with the host cell, which can cause the circuit as a, as a whole to fail. Now, in all of these cases, figuring out precisely how a circuit that consists of say, know, tens or hundreds of parts has broken down by just looking at, say, the output of the circuit is really impossible. Um, and so other engineering fields have really tried to tackle this challenge by developing specific tools like debuggers and multimeters. But as bioengineers, we really lack the ability to actually see the complex transcriptional flows within our circuits and therefore it's really hard for us to understand how precisely they're, they're breaking down. Now, to try and address this over the past five or six years, um, we've been attempting to build what I would call a genetic debugger. 
that uses RNA sequencing to provide a more complete view of like the entire transcriptional state of a circuit. And so this works by carefully processing and interpreting RNA sequencing data um, to allow us to measure how each of the individual genetic parts and devices is functioning, as well as the response of the cell to the circuit. Now, this is kind of a demonstration of how this system works at a very high level. And so we begin by basically sampling our system in all the possible states that it can take. We then process these samples using a, a highly multiplexed RNA sequencing method and then use this data to generate what we call transcriptional profiles that capture basically the RNA polymerase flow along the entire length of the circuit. Now, using these uh, transcriptional profiles, we can then interpret them using basic kind of mathematical models to start inferring how individual parts within the circuit are functioning as well as how the cell is actually responding to the circuit itself. Now to show you how this works in a more practical setting, we've applied this approach to a large uh, three input genetic logic circuit. So this composed of more than 40 different genetic parts. And when we put this circuit into a living cell and test the functionality using flow cytometry, we find that for many of the combinations of inputs, the response that I've shown in gray here actually matches our expected output, which is shown by these red and blue lines. And it's only really these last three input combinations where we see some deviations. Uh, and so to try and better understand what might be the cause of these deviations, we, we sampled this circuit for each of the different combinations of these inputs and performed the RNA sequencing and then use this data to generate transcriptional profiles for each of the circuit states, uh, such that we had basically an overview of the RNA polymerase flow across this, this entire circuit. Now, here again, I've overlaid these uh, blue and red profiles. So you can see the kind of expected flows that we, that we wanted to see. Um, and you can see that on the whole, they kind of match the experimentally measured um, flows, but there is some variability. Uh, and it's this variability that we want to try and understand better. Now, while this is a, a nice holistic view of what's happening, what we'd really like to be able to do is to kind of um, better understand how each of these individual parts is leading to these various fluctuations. And so to, to do that, we zoom in on each of these profiles and use mathematical models to interpret changes in RNA polymerase flux across promoters to measure their kind of absolute strength and drops across terminators to capture their termination efficiency. Now, to make sense of these values in the context of the circuit's function, we also need to better understand how the genetic devices that these parts are used in are actually behaving. And so, what we do is we bring together measurements of the input and output promoters for each of the devices and then fit response curves to kind of estimate their function in the context of the circuit. Now for sensors, this allows us to see how on and off states vary. And for logic gates, we can actually assess the entire uh, response function. And by comparing these experimentally measured behaviors to those that we're expecting, which are shown by these little dashed lines, um, we can start to see where deviations are occurring and use this as a, an approach to pinpoint, for example, the root cause of failures, um, but also understand where changes in the circuit design are, are most likely to have actually a beneficial effect on the overall circuit performance. Now, as mentioned earlier, transcription is only part of the process when we're actually expressing a gene. Um, Translation also plays a, a really key role. And more recently, over the last couple of years, we've been exploring how other sequencing technologies like ribosome profiling or riboseq, it's sometimes known, um, can be used to actually complement the RNA-seq data and provide a more complete picture of the entire circuit function. Um, in addition, we've also been trying to refine some of our sequencing protocols to actually include external RNA spikings that are introduced at, at known molar concentrations such that we can then recover 
transcriptional and translational flows in, in absolute units. So not, not just in having measurements that we can compare between each other, but measurements that we compare across experiments or across hosts, across anything, basically. And this is really crucial for producing accurate models of these systems and really begins to allow us to understand just how crowded the DNAs and the RNAs in our circuit actually are. Now, an area we've been applying this combined approach to is, is measuring the burden that synthetic genetic circuits can place on, that, on a host cell. Um, and if this isn't carefully managed, then you end up with a tug of war for kind of essential shared resources like ribosomes. And this can lead to the triggering of stress responses and actually reduce the stability of the circuit that you're building. Um, and so by using our combined sequencing approach, we can take a genetic construct like this, which in, actually includes a, what's called a, a viral pseudonot, which is known to, to both stabilize the transcript that's produced as well as cause a significant um, sequestering of ribosomes by basically causing them to pause during translation. And we can then directly see the impact that this has globally on the translation of every single gene in the cell. So this is a way of capturing the actual, the physical burden that this is having on the, on the host that this, this circuit's being expressed in. And what's really nice is we can go even further and use the combined data to see precisely how both transcriptional and translational resources are being reallocated when a circuit's being expressed. And this is really gonna be important, as I said, we start scaling up some of these design processes to the, the level of genomes where we, really have to start thinking about how resources are being used and whether they're being um, used in the most e efficient manner. Now, my group is not only focused on observing how genetic circuits work, um, we're also interested in trying to develop kind of new ways to, to make these systems more robust. Now, one of the challenges in this respect is the fact that genetic parts and devices often behave differently when pieced together in new ways. And these shifts can cause an entire system to break. Now, one approach we've been taking to try and tackle this issue is to develop what we've called tunable genetic parts, where the input-output relationship can actually be dynamically altered, a bit like how you kind of alter the sound from an amplifier by tweaking the various, um, the various options that you have on its design. Now to achieve this, one of my um, students, Vittorio Batoli, um, developed what he called a tunable expression system, where the amount of protein produced for a given transcriptional signal could be regulated by the secondary tuner input. Now this device worked by using what's called a toehold switch that allowed for the translation rate of the protein to be governed by the expression of a, a small trigger RNA. Uh, and when he tested the system in E. coli, what he was able to show is that he could easily amplify or suppress uh, the input to protein relationship over several orders of magnitude, which makes it a really flexible system for kind of tuning different aspects of um, gene expression. Now, on its own, that might not seem that useful, but I think the real beauty um, of that kind of simple regulatory motif is that it can be really easily integrated into other genetic devices. Um, and by doing so, it allows you to then tune key transition points in their response functions. So here you can see that we've actually included one of these tuning devices um, into a, a genetic NOR gate. Uh, and you'll able to see in these results at the bottom how it enables us to shift the transition from kind of an on to an off state, um, dependent on the, the strength of this, this tuning input. Now, this is really important in larger circuits actually where we might wanna connect many of these devices together because in order for the connected parts to function correctly, they need to be matched. Now, normally, if a mismatch is found between two components, we have to basically start from scratch and rebuild the, uh, the circuit from like fragments of DNA. But by using these tunable devices, what we can do is merely tweak the tuner inputs until all of the components are basically compatible with each other, saving a lot of time and, and, and effort. 
Now, while Vittorio was working on this project, another of my students, uh, Veronica Greco, was struggling to control the expression of a, a protein where even a small amount at the wrong time would cause her system to fail. And so when she saw Vittorio's work, we were wondering if we could repurpose it to enable the more stringent control of gene expression by having both the input and the tuner signals connected to the same promoter. And what this would cause is effectively both transcription and translation of our gene of interest to be regulated and therefore kind of limit the chance for leaky expression to occur. Now, Veronica built an entire um, genetic toolkit, which you can actually get off of AdGene if you're interested. Um, and I don't have time to go into those. Um, but for the tests that she ran with kind of some simple reporter protein, she was able to show really huge improvements in both the fold change, dynamic range, as well as the relative basal expression, um, both in vivo and in cell-free expression systems. When she compared this kind of what we call multi-level approach to kind of a, a single level controller that only uses uh, transcriptional regulation. Now, an additional benefit we also found of having separate promoters driving transcription and translation was the ability for the controller to also suppress what's called intrinsic gene expression noise. Now, this is a type of promoter noise that occurs basically as random strong bursts of expression followed by long periods of inactivity. And so this results in a low level of expression if you average over, over time. Now, one of the problems is these short bursts can sometimes lift, lead to long lived um, effects if the proteins are, are stable. And so they can really cause problems when you're trying to maintain really stringent off states. But what we found with our multi-level controllers is that because we had these two separate promoters and because the noise is uncorrelated and random between these promoters, it was actually very unlikely that both of these would fire at the same time. And so the, the controller effectively suppressed this type of noise within the system. And so this is one area that we're starting to explore in terms of how these devices might be used. And we're also kind of exploring whether we can kind of choose specific points in circuits. So not necessarily using this everywhere, but a, a kind of key elements to kind of boost signal strength and, and hopefully improve the robustness of, of some of our systems. Now, another approach that we've been exploring to control transcriptional flows is by engineering um, the terminators actually that are normally designed to stop them. Um, now, nature also makes use of this type of regulation uh, to coordinate normally the co-expression of, of many genes that have become localized in DNA. And this is a, uh, an example of a of the transcriptional flow in the B subtilis genome, where we've got a sing single promoter here that's used to drive expression of these um, four downstream genes, with these two terminators here used to not halt, uh, halt expression but, or the entire flow, but to instead allow for some transcriptional read through. Uh, and so this allows these terminators to act a little bit like valves um, regulating the flow of, of RNA polymerase um, along the DNA. Now we were interested in whether we could develop our own transcriptional valves. Uh, and one of my students, Matt Tanovsky, uh, took up this challenge and decided to use a, a modular design in which a core terminator sequence was supplemented with an upstream, what you call modifying sequence that would then exploit some local contextual effects and interactions to actually influence the strength of termination. Now, he initially chose a number of basic modifying sequences that would either directly base pair with core elements of the terminator or form specific um, structural elements that we thought might actually insulate the terminator from other contextual effects. Um, and what he then did, um, uh, uh, considered, yeah, this was, he, he was kind of interested in, in seeing how these modifiers would, would, would affect those things. And so if we'd used a, a sort of a typical fluorescence type um, characterization approach, then this would have taken a long time to uh, assay all of these, these designs. And so instead, 
we chose to develop a, a new characterization method that was based on nanopore direct RNA sequencing, which unlike Illumina short read sequencing, allowed us to capture the entire sequence of all of the transcripts that were present in our samples. So, so by combining a, a one-pot pooled assembly method with in vitro transcription and then nanopore sequencing, we could exploit the fact that each transcript encoded its transcriptional valve design either at the three prime end if termination occurred, so these ones here, um, or within the transcript if termination didn't. And so these intrinsic barcodes could then be used to demultiplex the data uh, and provide simultaneous measurements of termination efficiency for every design in the library. Now, each point in this graph is basically an individual valve that we've grouped by core terminator and then the different modifier types I showed on the, the previous slide. And what you can immediately see is that the modifiers can have a really big influence on termination efficiency. And also that some can have a positive effect and others can have a negative effect. Uh, we're still currently digging into to kind of what these relationships mean and whether we can actually use these to kind of rationally engineer them. Um, but one of the kind of, I think, key things I also wanted to highlight is that we don't just get these kind of single efficiency measurements from this type of experiment. Instead, we're actually enabled to uh, generate nucleotide resolution profiles that allow us to then much more intricately peer into the termination process itself. And this allows us to see precisely where termination is occurring and the absolute effect that the, the modifying elements are actually having upon it. Now, in addition to trying to sort of understand how we might design better valves, we're also beginning to start put them, starting to put them to work in actual uh, real applications. And in particular, one of the, the first things we've been looking at is how we might chain several of these together to control the, the stoichiometries of RNA-based regulators. Um, so this is an example where we've got a, a single promoter that's basically driving expression of these three guide RNAs. And we're using these valves to basically regulate the relative uh, amounts of each of these guides. And this obviously is useful because we can then kind of look at combinatorial effects and, and strength effects between these different outputs. Uh, and this can be obviously used for gene regulation or even things like gene, genome editing. And so we're, we're quite excited because we think this, this type of part could actually be a really nice addition to people developing kind of RNA-based circuits. Uh, and over the next few months, we'll be putting out a new preprint that actually incorporates a huge number of new experiments where we've shown how these, these valves can actually be used. Um, now to, to end, I wanted to look a little bit more towards the future uh, and how biology poses actually some unique challenges to engineers. Now, I suspect some of you might be wondering why there's a collection of crabs on this slide. Well, these, these are not actually crabs per se. And in fact, they're an example of carcinization, which is basically the convergent evolution of crab-like forms from non-crab-like forms. So these critters are actually more closely related to um, lobsters than they are crabs. Now, we probably don't need to worry about our genetic circuits turning into crabs, but the reason for showing this is that we shouldn't underestimate the, the role that evolution plays in all biological systems, including our circuits. But yet at present, it's often a component that's um, overlooked or, or completely ignored. Now to try and show you the, the challenge that this poses, um, I've drawn here a schematic of how biological design is typically performed. Um, so let's call it, I don't know, bi bi biodesign version one. Now, normally you would start with a, a number of candidate designs that you then explore further by maybe tweaking various aspects or using some intuition. And some of these might turn out to be dead ends, while other, others might I know, spark kind of links. And you end up with a final design that basically displays the behavior that you want. Now, this exploration phase can be performed manually, which has been done historically, but obviously more recently, this can also be automated. So like I said before, tools like Cello, this, this kind of search phase is, is the thing that they're, they're looking at. But this is normally what we think about when we're talking about the design process itself. 
Now, in most engineering fields, once you have a design, it won't then change normally that much when it's used. But for a biological system, this isn't the case. A biological design can potentially evolve over time, and so it can deviate from its original function. Um, and so when we think about biodesign, what we effectively have is a period of artificial, artificial um, evolution, which is basically our design process for, for version one, followed by a period of natural evolution where the biological system is actually then put to use. Now, in addition, there is also normally what we call kind of like an operating window over which the system is said to be functional. And so if evolution doesn't push the system outside of this region, then we don't need to worry. But what we're finding is that as many of the functions we implement often really impact upon the cell's ability to grow and its, its uh, uh, vitality, um, virtually all systems that we make will, will break. And basically at the moment, we often just hope that isn't before the, the kind of desired lifetime is actually reached. Now, what my lab has been starting to think about over the last couple of years is how a biodesign workflow might look if we actually took a more complete view that integrated both the artificial evolution of our own engineering and the natural evolution of the biology once it's actually deployed. Now this sort of approach would then allow us to think up front about the size of an operating window and ways that we might reduce the ability for evolution to affect our design over the desired lifetime that we have for the system. Or potentially, and more interestingly, in, in my view, it, it allows us to think about how evolution itself could be harnessed to automatically search out new functionalities um, due to, I don't know, shifts in the environment or, or changes in the functionality that's actually needed. Now, this type of adaptation really touches on one of the kind of unique characteristics of biology that we haven't really figured out how to engineer yet. But I think it's going to be really crucial that we start thinking about these things if we really want to harness biology's kind of full potential. Now, to be able to uh, effectively describe and reason about biological designs in this way, we need effectively a conceptual framework uh, to do so. And so one of my PhD students, Sim Castle, has been developing what he calls the evotype as a way of capturing the evolutionary potential or capacity of a biological design. Now to understand the evotype, we lent on the idea of um, an adaptive landscape, which is kind of pioneered by Waddington, but we altered it in a number of um, key ways. So we start similarly with a, a 2D landscape that is used to represent the sequence space around a design, so this red dot. And then we, we use kind of three core aspects that shape the artificial and natural evolution of the design. So namely, kind of the possible variation within the system, how well the, the system's function meets our desired goal, so basically its utility, and the, the natural selective pressures that are present affecting its reproductive success. Now to combine this information, we first consider the variation that's possible. Now, many different processes normally contribute to the mutations and changes of the genotype of a, of a biological system. Um, some of these introduce small changes like um, slip strand mispairing, where you can have others that could result in large, what are sometimes called algorithmic changes, such as jumps that you see during recombination of, of repetitive sequences. Now, for an e evolving biosystem, each of these processes combined together and can be represented as what we term a, a variation probability distribution that spans over the sequence space. And this basically provides us with a probability that the design type we're starting from will jump to another part of sequence space during evolution. And so we represent this probability by a kind of the darkness of shading across the, the evotype landscape. So we're now able to represent the possible routes that evolution might take, but evolution isn't only shaped by variation. Um, both the natural and artificial selection will also play a role. And so unlike in an adaptive landscape where the, the height is related to the fitness of a sequence here, 
the height actually corresponds to something we've named fitneity. Now, the idea behind fitneity is that it captures a, a combination of the artificial and natural evolution that's present within a biosystem, um, which fundamentally is governed by the utility and fitness that drives them both. And it can be sort of thought of as a, a way of calculating how good a design is in the context of the, the system that we're looking at. So if, to give you an example, um, every design we create will need to perform some function and how well it performs that function is basically its utility. So a high utility would be seen as good. Um, similarly, because this is a living system, uh, a good design also needs to allow the organism to reproduce and so not cause excessive stress. So a high fitness is also good. But as it's rare to have both these aspects maximized, um, fitneity basically is a function that captures how much deviation in utility and peak fitness we're willing to accommodate. And so basically how well the design meets both our needs and its own needs in, in some respects. So ultimately, in this con conceptual framework, what, what a bioengineer is actually trying to do is not only shape the function of a, a single biological design at the point where it's going to be used, but they're also trying to sculpt this surrounding evotype landscape such that evolutionary change that can, can occur during its use is either managed or exploited through choices in the variation, the function and the selection that are actually present within the system itself. Now, this allows us then to carefully craft the evolutionary potential of our designs and, and harness evolution as a, a first class citizen during the entire design process, rather than ignoring it and, and seeing it as something that, that's handled afterwards. Now, at first hand, this probably uh, seems like an impossible task, and it did to us initially, but what you find when you start looking across the field is that there are actually many principles and biochemical tools that are necessary to start shaping some of these factors. So for example, um, the variation in a system can actually be reduced by avoiding repetitive sequences, so through recoding the, the, the DNA in specific ways. Or we can actually try to allow the sequence to change in specific ways by actually potentially harnessing kind of targeted recombination. Similarly, for things like selection, we can we, we know ways of actually reducing the, the burden that our designs place on a cell. Um, and there are also examples where you can start to design systems, actually start to couple the, um, the function of a system to the, the ability for it to grow. And so this allows for, for these two aspects to become kind of interwoven. Now, as you can see, we do have some principles and tools to start shaping these kind of evolutionary potentials but we probably still need a lot more. Um, and one thing we desperately need is more quantitative data about how these, these methods and principles and tools actually work, because we don't currently have very good predictive models for their use, but it's an area that's gonna be crucial uh, to actually engineer kind of the evolutionary aspects in these systems. Now you can probably guess that my group's starting to explore some of these uh, areas using sequencing and some other methodologies, but there's really a, a long way to go in this area. And I hope that this might have piqued the interest of a few of you to take up this challenge, because I, I really believe this is, this is kind of the, this is where the field could potentially go and where there's going to be some really unique uses of biology that, that other engineering fields just can't, can't meet. So that was kind of everything I wanted to, to tell you, um, but I got a couple take home messages. So, so first, I hope I've convinced you that flows of molecular machines are really crucial to the execution of genetic code. And that I would say it's our job as bioengineers to basically try and control or develop ways to control these in, in different ways. Um, second, while tools like fluorescent proteins are obviously have revolutionized all aspects of biology, um, the multi-component nature of genetic circuits means that we really need more comprehensive ways of monitoring these systems. Um, and so I've tried to show here how sequencing might offer one way, but I think we really need to be more open to exploring other kind of avenues for 
for how we can actually see what's happening in these systems. And, and uh, I, I think we just need to be more creative and more open to actually exploring how we can better understand what's going on. Um, another aspect I touched upon is that while there's often a, a push in synthetic biology for kind of simpler kind of bottom up approaches, I think we should also consider how we can add complexity in specific ways to actually improve the performance of our system. So I think kind of embracing some of the, the craziness we see in biology rather than avoiding it could also be helpful in, in some contexts. Um, and finally, I, I gave you kind of an, an overview of how my group's been starting to think about the role of evolution in biological design. Um, and I think this is an area which I think is gonna be really crucial in the next decade in, in terms of if we wanna deploy these systems into the real world, we have to have ways of, of not just looking at what's happening evolutionarily in these systems, but actually potentially engineering it as well. Um, and so with that, I just wanna yeah, thank you for listening and also acknowledge a lot of the people that were involved um, as with all sciences, it's a team effort. So a, a lot of the initial um, sort of debugging work with RNA-seq uh, was done while I was a postdoc in Chris Voigt's lab with Alec, Hyonjin and, and Lin. Um, the ribosome profiling kind of translational aspect was um, done through collaboration with Zoe Gnitova at the University of Hamburg with Irina, Mete and Priyanka. And some of the um, self free system work that was done with Veronica's uh, multi-level controllers was done by um, Amir Pandey from Tobias Erb's lab. Um, and yeah, I just wanna thank the research councils for the funding they've given me and also my group for um, always, yeah, coming up with crazy ideas that we can follow up in the lab and, and, and not being afraid to kind of tackle some of the really big questions that I think exist in, um, in synthetic biology. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to stop sharing and take any questions. We're a bit short on time, but I, I think it's always good to remind folks that we do have a gather social hour. If you do have time to attend, that might be a chance to allow for additional questions as well. And as I was saying that, we just had our first question pop in on the chat. Um, so the question goes, how robust are natural genetic circuits to natural evolution? And in particular, what mechanisms do they use? And ooh, this is a long one. How do natural genetic circuits balance <laughs> evolvability to new useful function? as a form of adaptation on the one hand and the robustness to remain functional despite evolutionary variability. Well, there's, there's a lot in that. And I think that, that, that question kind of highlights all of the key things that we would like to know that we probably don't know at the moment. So, um, so in terms of, I guess, robustness of natural genetic circuits, um, what, what you find, obviously, the genetic code itself is robust to mutation. So you have these codons that are degenerate, and that's you could see that as a form of robustness in some ways. But like the kind of the question goes on to say, there's a there's a fine balance, especially in natural system, between being able to adapt to changes as well as maintaining some kind of viability within a certain environment. And I, I don't think we really it's different for every natural system and it would be different for every engineered system as well. Some systems, for example, I don't know, if we're producing something with biology, we probably want it to be incredibly robust. We don't want it producing something different randomly halfway through the process. So we'd have to, we'd have to design it in such a way that, that robustness was kind of the key attribute. Whereas if we're looking at, for example, I don't know, um, deploying a system into the actual the environment where it potentially the conditions can quite dramatically change it might be essential that the cells can evolve to in, in order to just survive in those different environments and so the, the kind of the, the balance would shift the other way to ensuring that these circuits are geared up to adapt in specific ways um, in terms of the point about the, what mechanisms they use I kind of highlighted a few there so Obviously, there are, there, are, there are errors that are introduced in some of the mechanisms of DNA replication and even in transcription and translation, which probably play a role in some of these processes. But if you look in a bug, is, is there are huge amounts of 
parts which manipulate DNA or they affect, they move bits of DNA around, they cut DNA. They, so that there's, there's, there's clearly a lot of um, machinery that, that nature is using to do this. And I, we really don't know yet exactly how these changes manifest and into different functions or, or, or things like that. But it's clearly evident that there are a lot of mechanisms for doing this. And we're only really scratching the surface so far in terms of a lot of the, the parts we've kind of tamed to use within our own circuits. And I suspect there'll need to be a push to actually exploring kind of the natural space of these, these kind of manipulating enzymes a lot, a lot more in order to, to have a, a set which gives us the capability of retuning some of these characteristics. Um, was there anything else in that question? Because I was so so, me so many aspects, I kind of lost lost track as I was um, talking. Um, yeah, so so hopefully that kind of I don't know if that addressed the question or not, but um, yeah, there's the, it it can be very system specific a lot of these things, um, which makes it very difficult. Uh, our next question swings us back towards the computational end of things. Uh, there's been a lot of, you know, talk about how do we communicate a mm -hmm. genetic part or circuit design. Uh, have you thought about uh, learnings from your group's work on how we might uh, take another stab at this and really move forward? Yeah, so what I would say, and it's, it's interesting, Chris raised it because he knows the challenges when you want to use these things for design. Um, the biggest problem is that there is, people have generated huge data sets on these things, but if I'm if I'm kind of harshly honest, a lot of the data is not usable in in like on a long term scale because it's not in units which are actually comparable. So you can you can have two labs doing experiments and generating terabytes and terabytes of data, but fundamentally they can't be compared. And so this idea of a data sheet breaks down if you've not got some common units with which you're actually recording things in. Now, there have been some really good efforts to try and correct that. And so Chris has raised kind of using kind of relative units where you've at least got some perhaps consistent unit thing you're starting from as a, a way of measuring those things. There are other people like Jake Bill's been kind of really pioneering some of these kind of calibrated units for kind of flow cytometry and, and kind of fluorescence type measurements. But what I would say is that where we should be getting to are absolute units. So the 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 approaches that I was presenting using the sequencing, the way we're, where we want that to get to is to be able to say how many RNA polymerases are on this piece of DNA or how many ribosomes and how dense are they. And those are the things that we need on data sheets in terms of, of using those things, because those are our kind of physical things that we can then start to design with. Something in an arbitrary unit, we have no way of knowing what the physical bounds of that are. It becomes kind of it becomes very difficult to, to design with. So I think my view is that we, we definitely are taking steps in the right direction. We're getting closer, but we need to be much more ambitious. And a lot of the techniques for making these measurements need to become simplified. So people in labs don't just have these arbitrary units that they're using, but they're actually able to, to kind of quantify what's going on in, in a much more concrete um, concrete way. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, uh, it, I have this kind of like beyond GFP thing. It's not because I think GF, GFP might be one way of measuring these things, but it's, we really need to be, think beyond what we do now in order to, I think, get, get around some of the issues that we have at the moment, which I think stem a lot of the time from having lots of data that we can't tap into because of the way it's been collected. And that's, that's a real issue, I think, in the field as a whole. Um, I had a quick question on my own, actually. So I really love this idea that, uh, you know, given a genetic circuit design, it might need to be adapted, evolved a little bit to ultimately conform to mm -hmm. uh, the user design specification. Has your group explored uh, ways of encouraging uh, a starting circuit to design to evolve in a given direction? Of course, you know, uh, Francis Arnold won the Nobel Prize for encouraging bacteria to uh, evolve certain enzyme kinetics and such. Have we thought about how can you encourage a starting circuit to become more like an OR gate or a NOR gate? So yeah, the answer is, we've thought about it, but it's really hard to do. So it's a, 
so yeah it would be it would be kind of that that would be the goal is can, can we harness evolution as well as all of these like computational approaches that we have now together that's kind of would be the the kind of the mecca in terms of, of things that we'd like to be able to do um but it is it is very difficult um one of the things we have been looking at which is kind of i would say is an intermediate step is that um when when you look at regulatory networks what you find is that the topologies of those networks are really important for constraining the kind of functions that can potentially be implemented using them. There, there's lots of kind of formal, method, formal methods that can be used to kind of say, well, this, this can implement these specific functions. So I don't know, like a NOR and OR and all, if you're thinking about logic, but normally it's more generic than that in some sense. And normally you have a single topology and actually what defines the actual function is the, the how strong these interactions between the various components are. And so by tuning the different interaction strengths, you can affect effectively the output function that that system has. And so one of the things we've been doing is, is, is starting to look at how we can have a, a fixed circuit effectively, but from tweaking things on the outside, we can effectively change it in some ways. And you could imagine that at the moment, rather than us tweaking it, evolution might be the thing that's tweaking it to, to take it down different paths. And you've maybe got some selective pressure for certain outputs that you're interested in. But I think this ability to, to create kind of adaptive systems rather than having to rebuild them each time from scratch and then do a selection and do another, like that, that is quite a slow process and actually this is kind of a, a nice way of kind of taking an intermediate route to, to getting to some of those kind of functionalities that we'd like. So we, we have started to look at some of those aspects, um, but the evolutionary aspect, like I said, is, is really hard. And the, the reason that kind of Sim was looking at this Evo type um, approach is that we really do need ways of describing these things kind of mathematically to be able to even think about how we would rationally control evolutionary paths and that type of stuff. So we're, even, we're not even at the point where we've fully kind of formalized what that would look like, um, but we're trying to, and that's kind of one of the directions that we're, that we're going in. Uh, it's super exciting. I'm definitely gonna look forward to the next episode of that work. Uh, one basic uh, question, uh, all this, there's a lot of parameters in play, a lot of different possible circuits in a perfect world, uh, and one of these RNA seq type experiments. How many, how many designs would you like to be able to test at once? Do you think would be, and what number would be sufficient to really kind of probe this evolutionary landscape? Um, the more the merrier, I would, say, I would say, as always. Like the more, the more you can look at, probably the better that you you, you can learn about it. But what I would say also is that there's been a lot of interest in everybody around these kind of like design of experiments and kind of information theoretic approaches for exploring design spaces so i would say more is better generally but not just more random things it's it's having an more of the right things to learn about how these systems work and so um and to give you kind of a, a kind of a ballpark for where we are at the moment so some of the work that matt was doing on these kind of simple you can think of these transcriptional valves as kind of very simple circuit with some contextual effects going on there he can, within one experiment, can routinely look at maybe a thousand different designs in real detail, so really understand what's going on with them. Now, realistically, if you're looking at a circuit and you've got that's composed of, you probably need millions or even tens of millions of, of, uh, of kind of assays to understand that. But I don't think we're that far away from being able to do that. I think it's a lot of it is around designing the libraries intelligently so we don't need to have too many and the other is just scaling these things up and we're actually we're, we're in, most of us are engineers these are things we can do this isn't kind of that difficult it just it just needs some in either some money thrown at it or miniaturization there, there'll be an approach to actually get around some of those problems and and if you look in any of the sequencing um areas throughput is has, has grown and grown and grown. And I, and I don't think that's gonna, it's not gonna stop majorly for, for a long time or we'll, we'll find other ways to, to kind of improve it. So I don't think we're that far away from being able to really look at circuit space in a kind of a more comprehensive way, but it's absolutely massive. So we're never gonna have a, a comprehensive understanding of everything that's going on, but we can start to probe certain maybe types of circuits or 
certain approaches we might want to be using for designing them. So we don't have to explore everything. Like you look at the, the proteome of cells and they, they, only, they only explore a very small number of folds and you look at all what can biology do. So you don't need everything. You just need the right things in order to do interesting stuff with biology. And I think that's, we have to learn that bit as well. What, what are the interesting things we want to start from to actually, to give us the flexibility to build what we want. Yeah, thanks so much for the response. And also much appreciated is the sense of optimism. Uh, typically, I'm at a company doing like protein design. And so uh, we similarly respect that the sequence space that we have to explore is quite large. But uh, to encounter folks working on a different problem that is related in its complexity, uh, it's very encouraging. Uh, do folks have other questions before I keep rattling off half-formed ideas? Otherwise, this is a good time to re remind folks again that we do have a gather social session. Uh, Prashant's just sent out the link in the group chat. There'll be a, another good place for us to uh, continue the conversation and to let thoughts develop after this excellent talk.